a lot for the invitation oh. um, to talk about this topic. I mean, the invitation was a bit more larger. I tried to narrow it down to, to be maybe a bit more comprehensive also for people that are not so much familiar with the topic, either from experimental sites or from being from different type of physics. So if there are some problems, since the audience is mixed in the understanding of what I'm saying, please please interrupt me for some small small things. I think it's uh, best if we if we don't rush through. And I have also I think it will be a bit shorter than one hour because I was not exactly sure how much time um, it should take. So please please don't hesitate to ask questions. I think this will also allow me to know better a bit. Um, what is clear and what is not clear in particular for the students uh, that might be not so much into this type of physics. Okay, thanks a lot again. So I will talk about Charmonium production and nuclear collisions. I will talk about introducing the topic uh, very broadly um, and then narrow it down a bit to, to quarkonia measurements in particular Charmonium and what has been proposed in nucleus nucleus collisions at uh, Phenomena and then I will go through this uh, experimental measurements. Mainly, I will talk about Alice there because uh, for the phenomena that I'm discussing, I'm mostly interested in the low transverse momentum part where Alice is, is best uh, placed at the moment. And then I will talk about related measurements and open questions and then talk a bit about uh, next points. So nucleus nucleus collisions is an environment that have a large number of tracks that are generated in one single primary collision. So for instance, in central nucleus nucleus collisions, you generate at the top LHC energy about 2000 charged tracks in one unit of pseudorapidity. So you see this in this event display. So this is a very crowded environment. And we look into this very challenging experimental environment in order to try to do many body QCD. So what you can imagine for those who are not so familiar with heavy ion physics is this kind of film of a collision. So where you start on the left side and go to the right and you have a collision of the nuclei that then lead to the generation of some kind of fluid that then is expands and that this expansion is uh, described by hydrodynamics or the exorbits that we have for this. And finally you freeze out um, and produce hadrons that are then screaming to the detector. And the time scale of this is uh, of this fluid lifetime is large compared to typical scale of perturbative processes in uh, that we look at in these collisions, but is of course much smaller than anything that we can detect. And we try to investigate this kind of system. And if you want to know where this is placed, let's say thermodynamically, we are mainly, mostly probing in this fluid time scale uh, matter that is in a kind of quark-cluent plasma state. So what does it mean is that we have a system that is no longer described by, dominated by hadronic decrease of feeding. More particularly, if you look at this plot, so this is just cut out from publication of lattice QCD, where you divide pressure over temperature powers in order to get the dimension as quantity and plot it as a function of temperature. And I marked in red what is roughly the temperature range that is described by this hydrodynamics. And uh, you see that this is a range where we are not yet in the regime very right, far right, where, where at some point you will get close to a system of, of weakly interacting gas of quarks and gluons, and we are probing, let's say, low temperature quark gluon plasma, uh, but which is not yet described by hadronic decrease of freedom, which you see in this plot on the left-hand side by this curve of a hadron resonance gas. So this is the region, this red region that we want to understand and to characterize. Um, so why is heavy quarkonium observable that is looked at with a lot of attention in, in, uh, in quark gluon plasma physics? The reason is that uh, one is interested to have signatures of deconfinement, which is the defining property of the quark gluon plasma, that you have a thermodynamic system where quarks and gluons roam freely for distances that are large compared to uh, hadronic length scales of one Fermi over C of, or one Fermi meter. And heavy quarkonia, so bound states of charm and anti-charm quarks or beauty and anti-quark quarks are some 
non-relativistic test system for strong interaction. Since, as you can describe the system, um, uh, like on the right-hand side with Schrodinger equation, where you put in a potential that has this form, where the short distance is described by something like a Coulomb potential and the long distance is described by a linear rise. And then different type of bound states sitting differently deep in this well. And this has been, uh, and the production of these states or the observation of, of these in the final state has been uh, proposed a long time ago to, to check for as a signature of the confinement heavy ion collisions. And there's also uh, still are to now based on lattice QCD and effective field theory, a lot of theory work ongoing to understand this also from the theory side formally better. And um, this is not what I will talk about since it's an experimental talk. I will talk really on the modeling side and on the data comparison and on the experimental measurements, but it's important to note that this also makes quite large progress. And maybe one thing which is important to note for the context of the collision is that heavy quark production as such, uh, and also its destruction is a short distance process because we have quite a hard scale in the process and there are perturbative calculations that are used for the production of the quark itself. I'm not talking about the bound state, but the quark. And in fact, what is typically assumed in the collision in the models that are compared to data is that the production happens early in the hadronic collision. So early compared to the time scale of the lifetime of the QGP and that destruction is long after the, the QGP lifetime. So in some sense, we have also conservation of heavy quarks in the system, which is important for for the modeling aspect of this kind of quarks and which is also helpful since it um, gives an additional handle since we usually assume that we cannot produce them just like this easily uh, with non-perturbative processes. So in heavy ion collisions, the problem is since we have this huge number of tracks in the final state, we have um, to to get this bound state detected out of this, all these hadrons that are produced, primarily pions. And this is why we rely on leptons because they are rare compared to the most of the other tracks. And what is typically measured is only the J psi, some measurements of psi to S I will produce. So this we can access uh, for shamonium. So shamonium is the charm anti-charm bound state. Other measurements of shamonium states that are possible in proton-proton collisions. And also there are a lot of measurements also in E plus E minus are, uh, have not been yet um, successful in nucleus-nucleus collisions since we have a huge combinatorial background because all the particles that you need to construct them with, with photons or other hadrons, um, they are very abundant in the collision and you have a large combinatorial background from these primary produced particles. So, and then there's another thing which is important to note for JPSI, which will be most of the talk about, since this is what where we have precise measurements, is that if you just detect JPSI without any other constraints, so you do your invariant mass fits, you count your number of JPSIs, or you correlate your JPSI with something else in the event, um, you have to distinguish between different sources of this JPSI. So there is uh, there is one contribution that can, can be identified with today's vertex detectors by displacement, which comes from b-hadrons, which is a small contribution at low transverse momentum, but can be uh, as big as 50 to 60% at the highest transverse momentum detected by Atlas and CMS. And the rest is prompt, where the prompt contribution comes either from direct production of JPSI or from feed down chains. So I, I will not make this discussion throughout the talk. I will mo mostly discuss inclusive shamonium in view of interpretate, interpreting it at low PT as prompt, let's say, to facilitate a bit the discussion. But this is something that needs to be uh, handled with on the modeling side and is also a major source of uncertainty depending on what one does exactly. So this is about the, the background um, on the measurement. And then coming back to the theory, so the, the initial idea was basically that you think of shamonium plugging it into the QGP and then just count how often it is destroyed or not destroyed. And this destruction has been associated early on with color screening, uh, analog to screening and electromagnetic um, uh, plasmas. This is the idea from Matsu and Satz. Then this was added to extend this idea to, to, 
to work it out for sequential suppression of Baconia. So basically trying to dial in different temperatures and different experimental conditions in order to see different suppression patterns of quaconium, so put less production than expected. And then using this suppression as a thermometer, as you see on the right hand side, where you can then see that different Charmonia would be destroyed at a different temperature, uh, depending on how deep they are sitting into this uh, potential that I was showing before. So this was the, the, the first idea. And of course, this is something that is still worked on. Uh, in the meanwhile, it has been found that for, for this, that for the description, also the imaginary part of the potential is important and other elements. Um, however, this is not what I will mainly talk about. Um, I will talk about mainly about one phenomenon that is that has been put into context at high collision energy, which is not suppression, but the fact that at LEC, um, we we could have late state production because we have a large number, large density of charm quarks that is seeing other charm quarks in the, in the QGP. And this may lead to production that, uh, that chase basically forms quarkonia from unbound charm and anti-charm quark pairs since they see each other at some point of the collision history. Uh, this is a cartoon that has been done to promote this picture but uh, it is just to give you some very intuitive idea of this. You have the start of the collision where you produce a large majority of the charm quark, anti-charm quarks, uh, and then they, they are not even producing yet the bound state. They're basically just uh, being implanted and formalized into this quark clone plasma partially, or at least are interacting with it. And then you form bound states. Of course, it can still happen that uh, bound state survives, that is that the charm anti charm quark bound state survives. But this is actually the question of, of the model modeling that is that implements this very basic idea. So there are two ideas. Either you basic to model microscopically or, say, or mesoscopically um, the number of, you assume that basically charm, uh, charm monium bound states are produced and destroyed during the lifetime of this of the of the collision history and you usually do for this some kind of rate equation like the one that you see here where you where you uh, assume that you have the number of charmonium cells as a function of time is controlled by um, a reaction rate that is a function of the temperature and therefore indirectly of the time and you either destroy charmonium or you regenerate Charmonium. This is the simplest form you can formulate this also. I mean, this is a result of integrating some Boltzmann equation or some other kinetic equation. And this uh, has been put forward a long time ago as, uh, as producing, if you plug in the numbers, you, what you see is that at, at, at uh, very high energy that the production, instead of being suppressed, I will talk about what exactly means suppression in this context later on, Will be enhanced compared to what you would expect in proton proton from proton proton collisions. And they are very different type of models that have very different conceptual uh, background of implementing this idea. Uh, and here you see a few of them references, but the very basic idea is always the same that you have a loss term, that you de destroy some ammonium, but that you allow for some gain term by recombining um, the charm quarks at a later stage. And then we have a model that is, if you want the, the, the thermodynamic, I mean, the, the limiting case of what you expect before, um, that you just assume that everything is only fixed at the last time of the evolution where you harmonize everything. So this is already an assumption that you say, okay, there is somewhat some common temperature where you freeze out everything. And at this temperature, you also fix the abundance of charm states, and this also fixes the abundance of charmonium states according to thermal weights. So you distribute the charm quark number that is conserved with, with, some, with some weighting factor that accounts for this GC, this fugacity that accounts to, to control this number. And then you have just the density that you would get in a thermal medium if you would producing just uh, hadrons in thermal equilibrium at this temperature that is then 
given the weight and that like this you can determine the actual density of the different quarks by having a product of this GC factor with the with the thermal abundance. And this, um, this GC basically goes like the square. And since this term here is dominated by, by, the, by the linear term, to, to first approximation, what you expect is that quarkonia are quadratically dependent on the charm quark density they put into the system. And this uh, has been parallel be promoted um, so this also explains why at higher energy where the charm quark density goes up, you expect higher values. This has been put forward at the same time as the transport equation approaches and is somehow an extreme scenario. Okay, so I hope this was more or less understandable also for non-experts. It's, it's very simple uh, in concept. And then um, uh, you, you basically can, can plug in the numbers and you have most of it is fixed. What you can play with is basically the volume. And then you have to know the total charm quark number that you put into the system. And then you can get some numbers for the total number of um, for, for the total number of charmonium states that you expect. So, so now we want to measure this at the LHC. And for this, it's, uh, it's always interesting to look at the different detectors that are at our disposal to measure quarkonium. So all all four collaborations measure quaconium, have measured quaconium extensively. It's maybe one of the few observables where you have a lot of measurements from all four collaborations on production. In nucleus nucleus collisions, we have only three of them because LACB at the moment is not yet granular enough to deal with this high density environment, which is far larger than the standard conditions of LACB operation. But uh, you have measurements of ALICE, ATLAS, and CMS. And here you have an ALICE two systems that I will describe a bit more in detail, the ALICE forward muon arm and the electron, uh, the electron channel that is measured with the central barrel. And then you have the powerful muon set systems of ATLAS and CMS, which have large acceptance, very high efficiency and high performance. However, since these systems are uh, optimized for PP physics, they have um, transverse momentum cutoff that you see here in this plot on the left hand side where you see the plane of transverse momentum and rapidity of the dilepton or of the charmonium state and you see that these measurements start for cms typically at 6.5 gv at mid rapidity and a bit lower down at forward rapidity and for atlas they are were lately restricted to 9 gv um, so since the only experiment that covers this low PT region, which is most interesting for this kind of thermal physics that I was discussing before, I will focus on this here and give you a few details also because this is what I what I'm familiar with. Uh, the high PT results are very precise that we have by now also from Atlas CMS are, are very interesting, but uh, it's different physics and also I uh, still heavily under discussion to understand this more in details. Okay, so uh, coming now to the ALICE setup. Um, so you have the ALICE muon spectrometer that you see here, um, figure of the ALICE DECTA as a whole. Um, so now we focus at this part that makes this setup highly asymmetric, um, which is dedicated for muon detection and which provides Charmonium uh, in this acceptance. If you go a little bit more in detail, uh, this setup has a large front absorber and then a trigger system behind an additional absorber and uh, has a lot of channels, uh, like 1 million in the tracking chambers, which is huge for a muon system and has, uh, has a dipole magnet of um, three Tesla meter. And uh, this detector was really built for absorbing huge multiplicities because when the design started, one had to extrapolate the multiplicity from SPS energy to LHC. So SPS is uh, center of mass energy of 17 GeV maximum to, to the TeV scale of LHC. So they were careful and they put a lot of material, which makes the detector, uh, let's say, very robust, but uh, which of course deteriorates the resolution. This is why if you compare the JPSI mass resolution compared between ALICE and uh, LACB, you have a factor of six, which mainly comes in the JPSI region from simply the fact that you measure momentum behind this huge absorber. 
whereas in LACB you measure it before where you measure all the headons. But you have a rather clean set of, of muons even in, in most central lead lead collisions that come after this absorber. So this is the muon system. Then there are also measurements by at least in the central barrel. Uh, also here down to transverse momentum zero. Um, and here we can also separate down to some transverse momentum this prompt and non-prompt component, even the nucleus nucleus collisions that I was talking about. And this um, is mainly based on a system of this inner tracking system, so the silicon vertex detector standard, and then the time projection chamber, a huge tracking device that I was showing before. And what is done is that we select the electrons above the pion line here in this plot and on the right hand side of the proton, so in this narrow uh, edge here, and uh, rely heavily on the very good uh, DDX resolution. But this makes the analysis also very tricky in terms of detector conditions control and um, corrections. The these measurements are luminosity readers are not the luminosity in these measurements that are act effectively used is not limited by by the delivered luminosity of the accelerator like for the muons, but is limited by the readout speed of the TPC. So this is why these measurements have typically uh, much lower luminosities uh, at latest they you reach a readout speed of 0 0.5 to 1 kilohertz whereas the interaction rate goes up to a factor 8 so you lose easily a factor 10 in statistics simply because the readout and uh, the TPC is intrinsically slow compared to the interaction rate that we can achieve in heavy ion collisions. And the signal background is, is much worse due to the, the various background sources that we can have. But you measure at mid rapidity where you have most of the other measurements directly. So if you look now at the signal extraction, just to give you an idea, so on the left hand side, you have mass plots. So the, the two, um, the, the upper two panels of the left side are for zero to 10%, zero to two GV. So this is basically the worst conditions that you can imagine. And you see the signal of a background is not very great. You see here the shape side peak. And what you do is often that you that you subtract this with a mixed event technique to estimate roughly this combinatorial shape to then fit later on the, the, the signal that you achieve on the right hand side. And you see that for peripheral collisions, so this is 40 to 90% where you have much less tracks, um, the signal of our background conditions are much better. And you have a very nice, uh, very nice peak. On the right hand side, you see the situation in the central barrel of Alice, where on the upper, upper right hand side, you see the, the raw mass spectrum as a function of mass of the dielectron spectrum, where you can see uh, not easily actually even the peak of the distribution. And then on the, on the lower side, you see how it looks like when you subtract the mixed events. So this is kind of uh, experimental conditions, nucleus, nucleus collisions, but in the end, we are able to extract this uh, rather well and uh, can measure different observables. So what I will mainly discuss is a nuclear modification factor. So this is a standard observable in heavy ion collisions, which basically makes a ratio between a yield measurement and nucleus nucleus collision. So here on the left hand side for this IA formula, you have this number of shape size this N already contains a normalization to the number of collisions in, in nucleus nucleus collisions, and you divide by the nuclear overlap function, which is um, a scaling function that that gives would give the same would gives an estimate with to combined with the cross section of JPS and proton proton collision that uh, corresponds to no nuclear effects or basically that of from going from a PP collision to AA collisions if you assume a point-like production of, of particles. And you can form a similar ratio nucleus in proton nucleus collisions. If you integrate over centrality, you can also take just the cross sections and take A or A square. Then you don't have this dependence on this TAA that you usually have to dis extract from a Clauber model. Um, that that basically gives you the relation between 
the charge particle multiplicity measured in a certain acceptance and this n col that you need to calculate this TAA or also n part, which is the number of uh, participating nucleons. So here, just an example, uh, how this looks like for charged particles, where you see a nucleus nucleus collisions in red. So this is this nuclear modification function as a function of transverse momentum, large suppression at high, uh, at high transverse momentum, whereas in proton let you see something which is very close to one. And this large effect is uh, signature of, um, is interpreted as signature of, uh, of pattern energy loss. So, so this is, is a standard observable that we also use in quaconium physics to quantify, to compare the situation in nucleus-nucleus collisions with the one in proton-proton collisions. So now going directly to the results. So here you see this nuclear modification factor as a function of n part. So the right-hand side of this plot corresponds to more central collisions, whereas the left-hand side means peripheral collisions. And you see the result at different collision energies. So you see in red, the top energy of ALICE, which is published by now. You see in green the result at the lower energy by Alice, and then you see in blue the result from Rick by Phoenix. All of these measurements are mid rapidity, and you see that whereas in Phoenix, when you go to more central collision, this measurement goes down. In lead lead collisions, you see something which is flat or even maybe goes up for the highest points. And you see, certainly for most central collision, the uh, suppression that is much weaker at the LHC than or even an enhancement than Phoenix. And this is exactly what comes out of these calculations for this non-primordial production. I did not compare in the beginning with the models because this I will discuss later, but this gives you an idea that you see really qualitatively different pictures. Same is true with much more precision with the measurements at forward rapidity where the dedicated muon spectrometer provides you this nice blue centrality dependence. So this is the same or sub, just measured at forward rapidity. And also here, the Phoenix measurement goes down and you see a huge difference between the suppression. And what you think is the interpretation is basically that this weaker suppression comes from the fact that you generate um, quaconia at late stage in, in the heavy ion collision. Rapidity dependence is also shows what one would expect. So that this charmonium IA is larger where the charm quark density is larger. And you see also some hint of a rapidity dependence in the muon spectrometer. So this, this is about the nuclear modification factor as a function of centrality and um, rapidity. We can also look at transverse momentum. And there you can also compare between lower energies and uh, high energies. So you see the Phoenix result, which is rather flat and has a suppression factor of five whereas the Alice data goes even goes up to lower transverse momentum. And this that this nuclear modification factor is so high is commonly interpreted in this way. So this, 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 is, this is for the nuclear modification factor. Uh, take note that I completely neglect here in this discussion the effect of initial state nuclear pattern densities. I will come back to this point later. So in addition to, to cross-section or yield measurements, one can also correlate um, the JPSI with soft particle production. So what is uh, used in, in, uh, to, to compare with hydrodynamic models is observables that are looking at asymmutal as anisotropies in heavy ion collisions. And the, the largest effect that one can see is the one that is explained on the, in the slower plot is that in non-central collisions, so this is the situation on the left-hand side where you have the two lead nuclei that collide not centrally, where you create a collision zone that has a long and a short axis. And the fact that you have these different short and long axis makes different pressure gradients on these two axes. And this creates a different push of the particles once they are treated in a common fluid description and that you generate then an isotropies in momentum space in the final state that you can then detect on the right hand side. And this kind of uh, observables that are sensitive to this where you correlate just if particles go in one direction together with each other compared to others in other phi direction, you can see this in two particle uh, asymmetric correlations. You can also construct correlators that extract directly Fourier coefficients of this delta phi distribution. And we can do this not only for soft particles where you have this very, very good description by hydrodynamic models, but we can also combine 
uh, quaconium and look how this correlates with the soft particle correlation uh, production and check if if this hints to participation of this charm quarks with this collective motion so is this pushed also sorry also in this direction so um, experimentally this goes very similar to the signal extraction that you have in for the cross section or the yield measurements what you just do is that you uh, do a two-step procedure you first extract as you see on the left hand side in the upper plonal so a1 upper part and c1 upper part you do signal extraction there you extract signal of our background from this and then you use this signal of our background to fit this v2 observables that you construct construct for all the all the dilepton pairs combined with uh, with a um, scalar product method with um, with the event plane that you get from from the soft particle production and the same you can do left hand side this is a muon spectrometer where you see the peak even well um, on a log scale plot or you can do it on the right hand side with the central barrel where you see in black the actual distribution that you use for extraction and this magenta fit is already the fit on the mixed event subtracted distribution and then you can do the same and you can extract v2s and what you see is that you can extract very precise measurements of this of this variable by now so this is something that was not yet at the five sigma level in one one and the major improvement in one two and this is the most recent publication which combines all the statistics that we have in nucleus nucleus collisions and when you extract this v2 as a function of transverse momentum of the quaconium you see this kind of bump structure um, and this is well in line qualitatively that you see this large positive v2 with what you expect from models that are implementing this non-primordial production and uh, until recently this kind of trend was not exactly reproduced by by transport models but uh, recently, the, the modelers from the Texas University group, they have modified uh, and taken into account um, different modeling assumptions to, to describe well this data. So this is by now can be understood this in terms of these transport models very well, this uh, large asimov line isotropy. And um, so this gives us a rather qualitative but consistent picture that we draw from from these nuclear modification factors as a function of various kinematic variables as well as from this anisotropies but um, this interpretation is largely is is, is largely uh, limited so this can be well demonstrated on this plot where i put the most recent preliminary results which will become uh, soon public uh, so will be soon submitted to journals uh, nearly identically. So what what you will see is that um, this precision by now with the integrated data for this basic observables that we can do is very good. So even in the central barrel, you see these black points get uh, decent statistical uncertainty and systematic uncertainty. The red points are very precise, also reach high transverse momentum, where we have overlap with Atlas and CMS, as you see in the right hand side, and where we have good agreement. So this is very well um, described. This is very well measured. But if you know on the models, so I, I introduced these two classes of models where you have destruction and generation and you have just generation uh, with a statistical simple model. If you look at these models, they produce the data and have huge error bars. But the interesting fact is that for producing those, reproducing this um, measurement, they put largely different input in uh, largely different input assumptions in particular they have one common input assumption which is simply the total charm that is in the system and this differs in this red uh, model so you see this tamu this uh, orange one and this blue one by a factor two for the central points of these models uh, also, the uncertainties of the assumptions are highly different. This is why the blue one, which has a rather generous uncertainty on the charm cross section, whereas the orange one has a very aggressive one, don't, do not agree either at all. So this is one of the main limitations why we are we are not able to to reproduce, uh, why we're not able to discriminate between these two simple class of models. And um, 
what can we do in order to overcome this in order to go more precise in order to to go hey, further yeah sorry my, my friend, we have a question yeah yes it's okay in this total well maybe you're going to talk about this but alice doesn't have measurements of a uh, charm production in in let let i will come to this okay I will come. I mean, now I will discuss basically what is so far available. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I imagine that there is no uh, measurement or something. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. I, I will explain. I mean, I mean, uh, maybe I go through and then I can comment later more in detail. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so one thing is simply to measure this total charm. So this I will comment on. And the other thing is to measure something like the Psi to S over J Psi ratios. On the right hand side, you have the nuclear modification factor of Psi to S divided by the one of J Psi, so double ratio effectively of let let over PP. And there these two models differ. And since um, both variables like the one here, you can simply see on the left hand side, have the same power of this GC, uh, inside for the statistical model, this cancels basically completely the uncertainty for the thermal model and for transport model, it also reduces drastically the uncertainties. So now, um, so the simplest thing is to do Psi to S. So from a theory point of view, you, you cross out a lot of uncertainties, but if you look at the measurements, this is tricky because the branching fraction is only 1% and uh, the cross section is smaller. So what you see on the left hand side is that at low transverse momentum so far what is published are only upper limits, which are completely compatible with the models. There has been some measurements of CMS uh, between one and one, 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 one and one two, which were also partially in tension between each other, but they're also not covering in terms of low transverse momentum, the region where you would really like to test this assumption up to precision, although they touch it um, and by now they have also only upper limits in this region where, where which is most interesting. So there is a measurement underway with the full statistics, which will be very nice and which will at least um, put a point on this kind of plots. Hopefully will, this will come out uh, soon and will be shown at Quark Meta. And uh, this kind of measurement is also one of the target measurements of run free. I will comment to this at the very end. So now we could also simply measure it directly in that let, as you pointed out. And the problem is that um, usually what has been done in the literature a lot is that you measure open, open uh, uh, D0 mesons or D plus or, or D sub S, and then you take the hydronization fractions that were measured at the lab in order to extrapolate to the total charm cross-section. So this is what has been done in a lot of publications of ALIS and also LECB in proton-proton collisions. But what has been observed consistently in different collision systems, so both in PLET and PP collisions, is that if you, where we are able to integrate the cross-section down to low transverse momentum, which is the most challenging one, that in fact, if you look at this ratio, so this is the most recent publication on the topic of a specific charm hadron normalized to D0, which is the most easiest measured because it decays in two particles and has a sizable branch infraction in, in pi k um, decay. If you look at this ratio, so the mesons, they look more or less consistent. So I, Mona is here compared with Monash tune, but the Monash tune uh, is basically fitting, is taking this information from fits to, to electron positron data, which is mainly lab and uh, SLD uh, at the set pole for, for measurements far above the baryon charm, anti charm production. And then you see here for the lambda C that the prediction of this uh, Pythia tune, the basic one that was used is uh, fairly under predicting what you observe experimentally. And same is true for the Xi C0. And this leads basically now to large corrections of the cross section that you extrapolate from the D0 down to the total charm cross section and needs to a revision of most of the total charm cross section. So if you want to look, you can look here. 
So this is now done in PP collisions by Alice. It would be very important to cross-check this by LECB so that LECB again measures baryons. So they were measured only one time um, with limited uh, precision uh, to, to redo this cross-section measurement, just to see that this is really also what you see at forward rapidity. And, uh, but this to measure the same kind of measurement to do in lead-lead is very challenging because this lambda C has only a C tau or 50 micrometers. So this is very difficult. And in lead lead collisions, you have a huge combinatorial background. So there is a new measurement recently coming out but by, by Alice in lead lead collisions on the lambda C on the full statistics. But even there, we have to stop at some transverse momentum. And this transverse momentum means that you still need to extrapolate by a factor two if you want to integrate over the full cross section of charm. And we still have no measurements of the other charm particles which can then also become non-negligible factor. Yeah, sorry. There was somebody asking a question. I, no, 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 there, there was no question. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay, so then there's one thing that has been done now in these model calculations, and this is where also why they differ so much. They try to extrapolate, so, so basically, this harmonization is difficult to measure directly in the collision. So since uh, typically we assume that we can describe heavy quark production with PQCD, even though in the end, um, the scale is for charm not so big, um, what you can try is to get information on predicting charm cross-section by taking the proton-proton collision and trying to estimate by how much the proton-proton collision result is modified by modifications of the pattern distribution functions. Because still you assume that um, factorization, at least with respect to the initial state, somewhat holds and that you try to, to get constraints on this. So this is one way of seeing uh, measurements that are sensitive to nuclear PDF or to saturation physics in PLET in view of this Shamonium question. So one way of looking into this is to look in into inclusive heavy flavor production proton nucleus collisions, where we know um, the lead nucleus PDF uh, very badly. Uh, and this is what we need to know for nucleus nucleus collisions, or we can try to get some ideas from exclusive production, although there we have other theoretical caveats to overcome to directly deduce this, to, to use this as constraint. So just to get an idea, so if you look at the proton nucleus collisions, we are in a situation experimentally which resembles very much proton-proton collisions. Average charged particle multiplicity is about three times proton-proton, so about 18 charged tracks at mid rapidity. So this is how it looks like in the Alice time projection chambers. And here we have very precise results from LECB. So I just took something more recent, which is uh, using also a bit harder scale of the process, but like this beauty production. So this is a nuclear modification factor of B plus. So these are the black points. And then green, you see non prompt shape psi measured by LHCB. And you see that in fact, OK, at, at backward rapidity, there is a, it's not a big, the, you were close to one for this nuclear modification factor, whereas at forward rapidity, you see a sizable suppression. And this sizable suppression um, can be interpreted as nuclear pattern distribution function depletion at low Björk and X. And here you see comparisons with uh, nuclear PDF parametrizations. You see, in fact, that compared to EPPS 16 and NC Tech, the uncertainties on this is uh, on the PDF is much larger than the uncertainty of the experimental measurement. Um, I will come to the caveats immediately. And in the literature, this has been used. Um, measurements have been used on this kind of type of measurements have been used to constrain nuclear PDFs of, the, of lead by remating. Um, I have just put the most recent references here. And on the right hand side, you see one example. I just took this one. Um, yes, is a question. Uh, no. OK, sorry. So you see the EPPS, which is the black line. And then you see in, in gray the uncertainty band, which is huge at this scale. And you see that this. I mean, the Björken X range that is interesting for us is about this, uh, is basically the mass scale over the center of mass energy. 
Um, and you see, however, that in this setup, what is the limiting factor is in the end, not the experimental precision on charm, which is here used for the rebate, but the uncertainty on theory. In this case, the publication, they argue particular on the scale dependence um, of, of, the, of the constraint. This would be helpful to do this with beauty, as you see on the left-hand side, where we are more limited by, by experimental uh, precision due to statistic limitations in PLET. So, and also just to note that forward ability in particular charm can be well reproduced also with color condensate calculations. So there are a lot of caveats to this. I just want to list them. We can have further questions uh, if you want. So they could be called energy loss. So the left-hand side, there is a calculation which could be as important as the pattern depletion. So on the left-hand side, you see for this B plus plot that I showed before, the estimate that comes from this energy loss in red for charm, uh, the group from uh, Arle or uh, Penier, they, they were basically reproducing the full suppression here. They reproduce about half of it. Then there is uh, the mid rapidity results have somewhat weaker as suppression as you see on the left at the right hand side plot where you see the nuclear modification factor on PLET, which is a little bit intention of this reweight based on the heavy flavor data that is dominated by LACB. But uh, okay, I, I would say that this should need to be remeasured with more precision before being very conclusive on this. But then, uh, so this is uh, then again on the conceptual side, there could be hydronization modifications, there could be kinematic modifications due to collectivity in small systems. And um, there is also observation of stronger as excited state suppression. So the psi 2 s is, is apilet is, for example, weaker than the than the J psi appellate, so smaller than the J psi appellate, which one would need also to take into account what this then means if you take the ground state to constrain nuclear PDF, which seems to be not the, the limiting factor of the procedure, but one needs to take it into account at some point when becoming more precise. So the most problematic things are actually that the kinematics might be not only PQCD and the harmonization might be also slightly modified since the number of charge tracks that you use in, in this ratio are not the same in PLET and PP. So these are caveats. So then one way to look into this is also to look in ultra terrific collisions. So this is an environment where experimentally there are just the tracks. There are much fewer tracks on so exclusive reactions, only the ones that are actually produced. So one process that has been measured a lot is exclusive vector meson production, in particular again, shape size. So same apparatus are used for measurements of this where you use the lead nucleus as a gamma emitter to probe the hadron structure. And then this the process is basically sensitive to the non-perturbative so-called generalized fluent distribution functions. And this is in specific limits relatable directly to the fluent PDF. Um, and this has been advertised also to measure um, this kind of depletion of the of and to check for saturation and for the co um, nuclear modification factors of uh, driven by initial state modification. So you have this pomeron that can be a leading order seen as a dicluon exchange. There we, we have also here very nice measurements. So this is the run one measurement. We have Ali's at mid rapidity, you have CMS in this mid in a mid forward region, and then you have Ali's again at forward. And this tends to a large suppression with, with respect to naive superposition in impulse approximation. And this can be interpreted as a strong hint of gluon shadowing or of uh, alternatively also of uh, saturation driven models. By now we have much more precise results in run two. I took now here the Alice results that are uh, already published at mid rapidity here. Uh, which confirm the measurements from it, from one one, and you have the forward results where we have also similarly precise results from LACB recently available, which are in slight tension, which needs to be clarified here in this rapidity range. And uh, however, here the caveats are that, um, like for the charm in inclusive production, we have large scale uncertainty, which one has to take care of. Then this connection between the generalized pattern distribution function and the PDF is somehow only valid in specific limits and is model dependent. And then uh, this needs to be at some point tried to see if this can be solidified or not. For the proton PDF, there are some first publications that try to, to make this connection 
uh, more robust on top of trying to just uh, let's say extract uh, here simple suppression factors and try to feed this into a constraint. Okay, so this brings me to my conclusion. Um, so Shamonia at the LHC is a rather direct observable of the confinement and the SPS, the lower energy based predictions uh, are confirmed by what we see. In this points to this type of non primordial production and we can discriminate experimentally between the type of models that we compare with our data. However, this is not yet conclusive because we don't have yet, uh, we are not yet able to close the door for putting to fit it to, to tuning the total chunk cross section that you need to reproduce the data. And this can be done experimentally. And we don't have yet a precise enough psi to s to, to have another observable that, that could be discriminative. Uh, within this model space. So there is an overall understanding of the situation that is more or less common sense to most of the, the people that are working in this area, but the understanding is rather schematic, uh, which is still well summarized by this cartoon that was brought forward very early on when this type of production was discussed first. So for run three outlook, um, the run three starts this year. This is a major jump in statistics, uh, factor 10 in luminosity roughly, um, anticipated thanks to a different uh, filling scheme, higher iron intensity. Um, and uh, for Alice, it is up to a factor of 100 because this, this uh, readout limitation, speed limitation will be overcome by continuous readout of the TBC. So this comes with the major Alice upgrade, which keeps us busy a lot in these late times. And the LECB upgrade will also have to see what it will be able to do. And it is possible that it will, in this area, also bring very interesting measurements in, in heavy iron collisions. And the LECB fixed target program can be also interesting because this is um, very nice to have a different precise point in energy, uh, where, whereas at um, RIC, in particular, open char measurements are of limited precision um, for, for a couple of reasons. And finally, there will be also not very far from now the already approved programs Atlas CMS. I'm not talking here about the far term future because this is, I think, more uncertain what will exactly happen. Um, but there we have also ambitious programs on all the experiments. So the goal of this run free program would be that we measure this total charm production, quote unquote, directly by measuring all the species and to measure site to S precisely that we have some more handle on the pattern distribution with cleaner observables, which is interesting on its own right, which I have covered here only from a very particular angle. And uh, this can be also interesting to see actually if this assumption of charm conservation that you can factorize with respect to the initial state is really true up to, uh, up to very good precision because there might be also some production at the pre-equilibrium state that is not completely negligible. And one interesting thing that I want also to highlight is that there was a first measurement of P sub C, so a bound state of a heavy uh, charm quark and a heavy beauty quark in heavy ion collisions by CMS. And uh, this is something that could be also interesting to see because here these kind of transport models and statistical models, there have been predictions which nuclear modification factors of five to 10 and would be interesting to see if this kind of non-primordial production mechanism also holds in this in this system, and uh, could have could, could give us also an insight on on shamonium and on the, on on this. And uh, hopefully, this this all of these measurements will allow us to improve connection to the modeling to theory and the connection to open charm to finally learn uh, more quantitatively about the the question posed in the beginning. So I have one last slide, just because I'm currently in Alice. So just a bit more in detail about what is the upgrade of Alice that uh, I was talking about. So as I was mentioning, there's continuous readout of the TPC, which is the main challenge. So I will hope that the TPID will be good enough to continue to make good measurements um, also in this collision mode. And the, there will be also, therefore, if everything goes well, extended measurement of quaconium. The vertexing will be improved. 
and will allow to, to do a lot of displaced measurements also for charm. And for the muons, there is only, quote unquote, a factor of about 10 with respect to the collected statistics. If you if you combine run three and run four together. Um, but we will have secondary vertexing. So we will and the signal of our background will improve because large fraction of the background that is currently in our sample are simply decays in flight that we can remove if we require to match with the tracker before the absorber. And uh, we started to look into the feasibility of B sub C to free muons at low PT, a lower PT that what is probably possible with CMS, which could be very interesting uh, to push this further. So that's all from my side. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for a very sure, 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 sure. No, but I'm going to okay. yeah.